have a question actually if uh, if we have some downtime. Yeah. Uh, could you each name, and I'll go last not to spoil it, a game developer that you consider an inspiration or kind of a role model? Hmm. Well, I, I have one um, while you guys are thinking, which is I just recently, um, pl- you know, so I watched Indie Movie, right? Which I'd recommend is just something kind of good for any developer who is, you know, exploring maybe what's involved and kind of some of the success stories and how it can go bad or whatever. Uh, you know, it's just an entertaining two hours to see kind of a documentary view. And one of the games that they feature is Fez. And so I, on Steam, just recently downloaded that just to, you know, have a 10-minute experience of playing it just to just to see it, you know? It's just a few bucks. Um, and uh, I, I started playing it, and it has an incredible first 15 minutes that I'd recommend to anybody. And <laughs> the way that they roll it out, I, I, I don't want to ruin it because it's kind of a surprise, um, but they roll out this first 15 minute kind of conceptual piece in a way that I found really inspiring because they are trusting the player to stick with them through those 15 minutes to get to kind of their big reveal of the game. And I thought, wow, that's a lot of trust in the community, you know, of fans that they have, um, and also just trust in themselves. So I found that inspiring, and I w- would, I, I want, you know, um, as we kind of did in World of Known, but even more so in Last Dream 2, to build in subtle elements where we accept the fact that not everyone's going to discover it uh, or, or even appreciate, you know, what we think is great about certain elements of the game. But we put them in there anyway because we're building and designing the game to the highest level we can. I feel like Fez did that. Um, I just think it's a fantastic game and, and it's an indie company um, and I you know find that inspiring and worth everyone's time <laughs> awesome Fez is a fantastic game yeah who wants to go next I I mean it's tough uh, I have top three contenders Square Enix Naughty Dog and Gear Box now I produce some of my favorite games um, probably have to go with Square Enix. I think primarily because they're responsible for, for Squaresoft, responsible for Final Fantasy, at least the earlier Final Fantasies, which were the best ones. Um, and predominantly because they, at least for most of the Final Fantasies, they really, really know how to tell a story. And with any good RPG, along with amazing mecha- mechanics, you have to be able to tell a story that the player can put themselves in and be one of the characters one of the main characters or even one of the side characters and just you know experience the game experience the story through the game and i, I think square especially back in the day uh was kings of telling a good rpg story and then like naughty dog is kind of in second place because of uh the last of us um Again, one of the best stories in video games, in my personal opinion. But very different from RPGs in general. All right. So I guess I will uh, follow up to both those excellent answers with a much worse one answer. <laughs> Is that I, for me, I I particularly love uh, you know Sid Meier and Microprose back in the day, um, and those. That genre of game, you know, the Civilization series was by far probably my, the majority of my childhood uh, was not, if not on a, uh, uh, NES or SNES, it was on playing the computer and playing Master of Orion and Civilization type games. Oh, yeah. So, as you can see, maybe I, I, you, you can be grateful that I don't actually do a whole lot of the story development because <laughs> I would be terrible at it. <laughs> But uh, um, so I, I I care much more about the, the strategy and the interplay of you know uh, this unit and that unit and that kind of translates to skills and AP uh, you know distributions on character classes and how they interact with the enemies and bosses and such. And I will say that the one thing you learn about 
Chris, having known him for a few years, is that he is, I'm not going to say annoyingly humble, but uh, <laughs> but definitely on the strong side of humble. So I have uh, written a book that has an audience of just 20 people, and it's important to me that the book only goes to 20 people, right? So it's 210 pages or so. Um, and my favorite uh, section of the book is without a doubt a page that Chris wrote. Absolutely love it. Just phenomenal, like, uh, character expression, and it, everything just comes across so, like, uh, potently. I, I just, I couldn't write like that, um, because it's just coming out of your own experiences. So, Chris is an excellent story writer, if we could get him to write more story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will, uh, thank you. I don't necessarily agree that <laughs> the praise, but... Yeah. And uh, as a commenter just wrote, he said, uh, you said annoyingly humble anyway, <laughs> which is true. <laughs> Ooh, very perceptive. Yes. Uh, can I get an answer out of Andrew, possibly? Uh, so I think I'd come down somewhere between Mark and Chris, where uh, my favorite games are both the Civilization slash Master of Orion strategy games, and the uh, Final Fantasies, the Chrono Triggers, the Secret of Manas from Square Enix. Um, so it's not enough for me to just have a good storyline in a RPG. If if the battle system's not engaging, uh, then I, I, I tend to get bored with the game. So that's why it's very important for me to work with Chris and make sure that we have a engaging battle system that where, you know, that's one of the reasons that we made some, some tweaks in Last Dream World Unknown. We saw, well, I'm, I, I'm using the same skill over and over again. I'm using my most powerful skill. So we implemented the cooldowns and warm-ups uh, to force a variety on the player to make the game more engaging. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm getting on a tangent here, so yeah, Square Enix <laughs> and strategy type games like Sid Meier. Okay, excellent. And I suppose I'll answer my own question. Um, probably my role model for developer, which is not to say that uh, he makes the games that I like the most, but um, certainly games that I very much enjoy uh, is Derek Yu. Spelunky, because here's a guy who, like NetHack, liked these top-down roguelike games, and said, you know what, I bet I can make a platformer that has the same core feel. And a platformer in a top-down roguelike should not work, uh, but he managed to kind of capture, like, what makes a roguelike a roguelike, and it's not the top-down sprawling exploration, it's mm -hmm. this kind of, like, you're at, the, you're at the behest of the random items, you're constantly being aggravated by these shopkeepers, you're, you know, each enemy has a different way to kill you, and these ways to interact, and he pulled it off. And the game, Spelunky, is a fantastic example of this. And just the fact that he knew he could do this, uh, that he knew he was confident enough in his skill, and he knew how to transform this game, I found very inspiring. Uh, and so I try to kind of, like, emulate that when I think about what do I? What feeling am I trying to get the player to experience? Uh, if I were going to be less humble, I'd say they did the same thing with the new Zelda game, where they tried to go back to what made Zelda Zelda. But I'm not going to compare last year to Zelda. So. <laughs> oh. So where are you going, Andrew? Uh, I missed one of the switches, so. I had to go back. Uh, my speed running is rusty. <laughs> I can tell you walking down a couple of dead ends there. Yeah. I like to think that you're just giving us time to talk more about... Uh, uh, that's right. This. That's exactly what I I'm doing. I thought that was the plan. We were, yeah. we were doing a quasi-speed run <laughs> so we could make sure we talk. Well, well, we, could quasi. we could talk a little bit about how this dungeon evolved. Because um, mm -hmm. yeah. I remember... Uh, where we started World Unknown as a building off of um, the ending of Last Dream, such that this dungeon in particular was the start of even more massive dungeons that are even more complex. And that was kind of the concept. And, uh, you know, Mandrew, with his brilliant mind, did that. And it 
I felt like it was me working on the opposite end where um, I could appreciate the depth of these dungeons, but I felt like there was so much here for the portion of players that would not be coming directly from last stream that we went through kind of this hard process of kind of um, scoping down this dungeon into something that was more manageable. And I can appreciate both sides of what Mandra was trying to do and, of course, you know, something like what it is now. Uh, I think I'd even do something even more simple than, than what's here. So this is a good a compromise hopefully fans will like. But uh, this dungeon was so massive that we were able to take pieces of it and create other dungeons out of it and also um, you know kind of add signposts to try to make the exploration more manageable so what's in here now as you'll see is some kind of uh, large you know stone gem structures that are connected to other locations to help signify to the player how they can kind of find their pathway through this Andrew do you have any comments on that? Uh, just that I'm getting horribly lost in my own creation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's where the side it's... came from. The door is locked. Uh, <laughs> and you're running low on MP. I yeah. know. Man, it's, it's I, I, only, just, it's I just want to make it interesting. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I do have to say that World Unknown does not have the MP drought in the beginning that last stream one does. Oh, yeah. Like, which Go I am so that is one thing that we we ha did extensive play balancing on because we wanted there to still be an MP restriction, not not maybe a drought, but that there had to you had to make a choice, put more points into you know AP points into MP, uh, conserve your MP when casting a given skill against a single enemy versus against six or more enemies, uh, and so. Uh, uh, as as early or as, as close as a couple months ago, we were, you know, adjusting the how much MP you could steal from enemies with the the thief and uh, those sorts of things. So, yeah, it's uh, definitely, you know, hopefully it's, it's done well. It's, oh, I, I really think it is. Like, it, I think it's just a fact that you're starting in last stream one with such low numbers of stat, like in terms of stats, that you, you can't. There's no way to balance mm -hmm. it, right? You can either make right. these early game spells super cheap or super expensive, and the yep. fairway is expensive. Whereas here, you start with several hundred MP, you can make the numbers work. And I think they do, because I definitely had to conserve MP, but I never felt like Last Dream 1 was a was a, a very hard for me as a mage party. Like, I think I said yes. I could never get mage parties to work, um, because I would, I would have to invest, like, five levels in MP, and I just didn't have the, like temperament to do it right the other thing is since you're starting out higher level 65 uh if you're you know very easy to easy or normal or whatever and then higher levels as you go to higher difficulties you you have you have access to skills that can potentially steal mp for your mage class um and that can be you know quite powerful if you uh you know, use the correct set of skill skills, say, with your, uh, your black mage. Absolutely. I mean, as amazed as I was that last stream one was balanced, I was even more amazed the first playthrough of World Unknown that this game that's basically stat-wise after the first game was also balanced. It was quite the effort. Um, I can say, you know, we did lots of repeated playthroughs um, and even, you know, simultaneous playthroughs and video chats and such to try to balance the game. I mean, that alone is a major effort. I have no idea, really, uh, Chris, how you do that without the experience of playing through the game. Like, as you're developing the formulas, how do you manage the super complex balancing across all the skills and leveling that could happen. I, yeah, what's your thought process on that? I, I, I uh, carefully consider it. I, 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 many, many equations. I, I throw it out, uh, and then Andrew adjusts it to the right value. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think there's the heavy leaning of, of just back and forth between Andrew and I, honestly, bouncing, you know, 
bouncing off uh, thoughts and wait, if we do this, then someone could abuse it like this. Generally, we would call that, uh, if you recall our colleague Billy, uh, uh, we would say that, oh no, that that's skill was billyable, uh, essentially, <laughs> because that meant that uh, someone would find a way to you know, seriously abuse it. Um, and so we would try and adjust how it either tweak the skill itself or lower the coefficients so it's not so strong. Um, and then, and then obviously there's, that's before we play test it. And then you have to play test it and you have to play test it a lot. And, uh, and it's still wrong quite often, right? I would, I would not say that we're, uh, particularly adept at getting it right on the first, the first, uh, guess, if you will, uh, right. in terms of how strong something could be. So the play testing is absolutely key. And, and especially with different parties, because that's the one thing you can build last dream and you can, you know, depending on what other characters you have could determine what skills and, you know, your AP build for a given class, whether it's the great, you know, how you're going to build the gray mage may be different if you have Andrew's current party versus if you had a party with a monk in there who could, you know, just lay waste and, you know, uh, um, you would you would then maybe use the the gray mage as much more of a defender to just soak up damage, and you build the gray ma- or the monk as a glass cannon and stick right. it in the back. Um, yeah. So you know, it, th- th- there's an interplay between the the different classes, and it's virtually impossible to get that right on the first first try. You really have to throw out multiple parties and then test them in different ways. Sure. And there's so many skills and so many balancing elements and the complexity is such that we won't know really how, you know, the game might be exploitable until tens of thousands of people yes. play it. Yes. And maybe not even then, um, you know, uh, I think when we play, I mean, when we offer up these competitions where we say, you know, we'll give 150 bucks to whoever can reach with Estonia the fastest or in the fewest steps or whatever, that's when we you know have an opportunity for a glimpse of where the exploits are and who can manipulate in a, the game in a way that we would not have anticipated but i think you know it's always so complex that you just don't know what's there very much so all right so mandra you're still trudging through the i'm about that you made too complex i'm about to get to the boss you know, this 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 is uh, coming out in favor of Josh's desire to. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, in all seriousness, there's there's multiple dungeons uh, throughout the game actually that were reduced and simplified after either we played through it or you know a game tester played through it and said, "Whoa, this right. is you know massive." Right. Um, and and I then actually, used them throughout yeah, the world. You're totally right, and I I do feel like an inner conflict on this because I can really get into the idea of Mandrew's development where it's so challenging that when you get through it, it's this major accomplishment. You're getting through it knowing that you've left a lot of players behind. Mm -hmm. And so I I find that appealing, but on the other hand, I don't, you don't want to frustrate people, right? You want it to be an enjoyable journey and pathway and my hope is that although some of these dungeons are super challenging, we've offered enough alternatives. Like right here at the beginning of the game, as Mandrew detailed, you can take the frozen tower or the abandoned tunnel. And so hopefully players that find one dungeon, you know, kind of too arduous or more than they want will find the other one, which does operate in a different fashion. Um, you know, uh, approachable and thus enjoyable. And then they may come back later to experience the other one. Mm. So we have a question in the chat from Lord of the Nine. It's probably for Chris. Uh, do we actually run any simulations of the battles to balance them? N- mm. Not that I am aware of, uh, other than our own, you know, playing of them. Uh, but in that sense, we do set up certain battles with certain parties and, you know, try a specific boss right and see okay how did changing this skill did it do what we want but yeah i mean i agree 
I, I actually just saw that on the on the chat as well, and I like your answer. It does appeal to the researcher in me as well that that'd be a, a very cool thing to to do at some point. <laughs> we can certainly extract the the algorithm, the core algorithms, and run them fairly quickly. Yep. Um, I would be really cool. I mean, we could even do something as as simple as just a Monte Carlo sampling almost, uh, exactly. not even doing a, a neural net uh, where it may learn. But um, but yeah. What if I get some smart though? Yes. Mandrew, um, the uh, person here in the comment se section is asking about um, release and such. I'm wondering, have we officially announced the demo release yet? Yes, I did that this morning. Okay. All right, so I'll provide that. But by all means, send the demo around. Um, we feel that there are a lot of people that would like this kind of game because it's kind of been a, a drought for these very vast <clears throat> old-style RPGs. Uh, you know, like it's great. Right. So, one question that I think we should address before, um, before the stream is over is the development process, because there's a very good question in our initial notes about what's it like to develop a game where we are all essentially in different places. Hmm. It's really tough. <laughs> Pretty hard, actually. That's a good answer. I like that answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one of the hardest things, I mean, me personally, is the artwork. So, for example, I'll be somebody will request something from me, and I will start making it, and I'm like, oh, okay, I can diverge down like three different paths here. I can shade this in this way, add some lighting here, maybe throw in a sword in that person's hand right there, or do something completely different. But since I don't have the guys with me, like in the moment, to say like, hey, that actually looks pretty good. Why don't you do that? Or yeah, throw shading right there. That that would look good. I have to create what I think is going to be best and then essentially submit it to them and say, hey guys, you want to look at that? And then they'll come back and say, eh, yeah, maybe you should not have done that. <laughs> and so then I have to go back and like, <laughs> and if I didn't save the layers properly, I have to essentially delete a lot of progress and then like redo half the, the art image. So that's one of the toughest things from working far apart from each other is the, um, the lapse in communication with each other. Well, or just even, I mean, there's, I think there's a fair amount of communication. It just means you you can't actually have confirmation as you're doing it. That's right. virtually impossible. Yes. And I agree completely. The the you know the, my trash can is full of discarded skills uh, after I throw throw them off to Andrew and and he <laughs> says whoa no <laughs> and uh, you know it's just it's par for the course. But it is you know it's like oh man I thought all this you know up for the skill and 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 no. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so yeah, that is a definitely yes, difficult thing. Sometimes it's pretty crushing when you spend a, a lot of time <laughs> on one particular project and they're like, no, that's not what we wanted at all. So we won't use that. One thing I feel like uh, Mandrew does do really well as kind of the leader of game development is that I, I feel like all of us are pushing ideas you know, to Mandrew, um, and it's a collaborative, you know, kind of environment where things are being decided on what's included. But, you know, I know Chris has lost a lot of skills, and Mark sounds like you've lost some art, and maybe I've lost some text as well. But I feel like the majority of it gets used in some way, even if it's Absolutely. refined, you know, right. somewhere else. And I think, I think that's good. I mean, it's important for everyone's morale, uh, yes, but it yes. also shows that I think we do a good job of creating a diverse enough game that a lot of what we come up with has a place somewhere if placed, you know, appropriately. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. hold on to those skills. I have a, a good use for game-breaking <laughs> skills. That is, not, that is not probably what Andrew is thinking. <laughs> A, a lot, a lot of those skills uh, uh, are not. There, and none of them are actually thrown away, obviously. Uh, and a lot of them are in, to be incorporated into Last Dream Two or other iterations of of the series. So, so. I should probably answer the question as well. Um, so I work on mostly the the programming aspect, and the nice thing about programming is that it does actually dovetail fairly well um, when you're working across time zones. Unfortunately, we're only in the time zones of the U.S., so it's not that bad. 
Yeah. Um, the main challenge for me is that uh, Andrew and I most have to be in mostly contact, constant contact because the format for this oh, particular yes. engine is a binary format, right. and collaborating in a way, if, if the format is text, if you're saving an XML or JSON or something that is just a text file, um, merging changes that I make with changes that Andrew makes is much easier. Sometimes it's actually trivial. And mm -hmm. if it's not true, if it's binary, things go crazy. And so we hacked up a pretty hideous solution that actually worked well enough for us to ship the game. And we are both looking forward immensely to switching to the new engine for Last Dream 2, where everything is text, and it will be wonderful forever. <laughs> I completely agree, yes. <laughs> I, I will finally be able to add add things into the game as opposed to basically having to <laughs> have the, go through Andrew. Right. Well, it's just too dangerous to have too many co no, no, co know. cooks in the kitchen because even with just two people, there's been at least five right. occasions where I've overwritten something Seth has done or vice versa. So yeah. I, I totally agree. There was yeah, one time when I created a whole bad. town, town... Maps, <laughs> and Andrew accidentally overrode all of it. Oh, brutal. Frustrating. <laughs> oh, man. Sorry. <laughs> I forgave you years ago. <laughs> it is pretty um, impossible, though. Like, we've been trying, and we both, after, after the first few times, we this was a problem, and so we both tried extremely hard not to do this, and it happens, like, to this day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say mo most of my uh, development into the, in the code for this one, I mean, I, I did a little bit more in Last Dream 1, but uh, has been uh, on the retreat when we all met together, or yeah. most of us met together. And then, so there was, again, there was an uh, instantaneous communication ability. Yeah, and I then, uh, or I drive up to Santa Fe, and <laughs> I am literally there with Andrew, when we're going through the code and <laughs> making changes <laughs> together. A pair of programming example for the ages. Unfortunately, right. I'm on the wrong coast to do that kind of fun. Mm, right. Oh, yeah. So I have a hard question of sorts um, that maybe we'll edit out of this video, but I do want to <laughs> ask. <laughs> 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 Which is, um, you know, so in one of my MBA classes, a technique that we discussed that I thought was really uh, kind of prescient was to assume that a business decision had gone wrong and then discuss why it had gone wrong, right? Um, but before it happened. So in this case, we'd say, you know, we're about to release Last Dream World Unknown. So you take the perspective that it's now six months later and it's sold, you know, six copies. And five of those were to us. You know? <laughs> and so it's a pre-mortem because you say, all right, let's imagine that it's failed. Now let's answer the question, why did it fail? So I can start because I'm fairly neurotic about this kind of thing and I think about it all the time. Um, I think one thing that could happen is, you know, there's a stigma with games that are released with this particular engine, the RPG Maker engine. Because, like mm -hmm. I said, the early engines were, you know, they had their, their, their problems. And the newer engines are amazing. Like, the amount of community modding and plugin support and just custom content, content generators is fantastic. You know, to their credit, they've made a great product. But a lot of people were burned by playing a lot of the kind of same feely game in the past, and they just mm -hmm. absolutely, you know, um, negative review any RPG Maker game yep. that doesn't have its own everything. Content zone. And last stream being a huge game, you know we have custom content. We have as much as we can, but it's 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 a huge game. You know, if you wanted the game one percent of the size, maybe we could draw everything ourselves and make our own music. We can't. We think the players like these dynamic, engaging experiences more and can forgive the occasional you know reused resource that they see in another game. Uh, and it may be the case that too many people don't. And I think that's kind of like a risk that we all know about, and we mm -hmm. try not to think about it because it's something that's outside of our control. But, you know, this is the kind of thing that can do in a small game is you kind of just get on this weird, I don't know, 
like trigger too many people or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think that's an excellent point, and that would probably be the top on all of our lists. But um, Last Dream was a success as an RPG Maker game, so I, you know, so this should at least have some of that same potential. But do you think that you know? So while I think that's an excellent point, do you think there's anything that's unique about World Unknown or about the time that we're releasing it in that you know could lead to it not being successful? Yeah, um, I think we've all played through and our testers have played through and we agree, you mentioned very briefly the strategy section, that it kind of ties the game together, it comes at a very high point, brings the history of the world back into the present. Like, it really is kind of a linchpin. Uh, if we're wrong and actually it does not have that effect, that would be pretty devastating. And we have a lot of data that says, a lot of data points that say, yeah, it really had that feel, but, you know, you never know. Okay. So, Seth, um, you know, there's that stigma against uh, RPG maker games in general, and you can generally uh, uh, spot the similarities right off the bat just by looking at some of the simple graphics. Um, and I believe the RPG maker hatred has actually grown even stronger than it was from when we released Last Dream 1. And, you know, yeah. throughout Last Dream 1, we... Uh, had our fair share of people saying, oh, RPG Maker, garbage, and instantly giving a, a dislike or a negative review without even, like, playing it. Right? So, your opinion of this game, we've made it quite a bit more unique than Last Dream 1, and we've added way more to it to try to separate it from RPG Maker engine itself. Do you... Th how do you think this game looks from the outside, from the very beginning? Like, is it different enough from your typical RPG Maker game that people might actually say, oh, that doesn't look like, you know, all the other RPG Maker games I've seen. What do you think, Seth? So this game, World Unknown, is <clears throat> much less um, egregious than Last Dream 1, probably because we've had more time and Mark has developed a habit of kind of like surgically attacking things that players see the most, like yeah. the main character costumes. Like, he's really identified okay, what is the player going to see? Let me make that a little more unique. Um, Fry. Yeah, no, it's very noticeable. And then, you know, someone suggested fairly recently that we redo that opening screen where you select your characters, and I think um, playing through Last Stream 1 again to make a new game plus save file, wink, wink, um, you really <laughs> see it. Like, if we can't ne necessarily make the... By the way, this character is one of my favorites. Um, yeah. <laughs> <it's apparently laughs> um, if we can't necessarily make you know everything unique in terms of content, because Mark can only do so much, uh, the menu rewrite was done by me, and I tried hard to make that kind of pulsing red cursor, and to make the characters walk in place with their costumes, just to make it be a menu that you don't see in other games, uh, just so that you know, players, the first thing they see in the game is refreshing, and then maybe they land on a world map that they can sort of relate to from other games, but we want to give them enough, like, the haters are going to hate, but we want to oh. give people who are in the middle enough to say, you know, okay, I can get into the world of this game, I'm not distracted by, you know, Alex, who's a generic RPG maker protagonist, or yeah. Yeah, what he's called in the later ones. So yeah, this game, World Unknown does a much better job. We incorporate a lot of even far-flung assets when we do uh, use existing assets, like the Oriental tile sets. Um, I'm a lot more comfortable with the, uh, what's called the RTP-ness, I guess you could say, of World mm -hmm. Unknown. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a very good point. And actually, we're going to see something fairly unique uh, in about a minute. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And I do as well love the opening character reformat that you guys did totally totally awesome mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. a nice um element because you know we're iterating within each game and making them better but we also get to iterate across games so when last dream 2 comes we get to take all the best elements of last dream and world unknown bring it into that game and then we'll create even more content i'm sure for that so you know it's awesome that we get better over time and collect more unique elements. And I think um, there's, you know, all the deeper things that we're getting better at, but it's also important 
for the kind of more surface things, the appearances, the graphics to look unique too. So it kind of signals to people that there was this depth of detail that we, you know, paid attention to the game. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I definitely want to make it clear that if we had the money to dump into graphics, we absolutely would. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. And I, I guess we can tell people that we have now hooked up with, I mean, We've had Mark forever, and Mark is awesome, but there's only so much that one Mega Man can do. <laughs> and so, you know, in addition to Mark, we've reached out um, to a graphic artist who we're now having a few hours a week crank out new art, and starting with all the big things like the world mark, uh, map stuff and dungeon stuff, but we have a few years, and we hope we can keep him occupied each week to crank out enough graphic art to kind of rework the appearance of the game. So I, that's an important investment that we're making that I think uh, is going gonna, is gonna to pay off. Mm -hmm. Just as a quick side note, speaking of iteration, the save menu, the preview on the save menu screen, correctly shows um, characters and events and yes. uh, background pictures like the tent canvas, which is something that <laughs> is shocking when you go back to last stream one and you don't realize how much that kind of adds to the immersion. It's just this tiny detail. Absolutely. There it is. That's true. So should Good. we talk about where Mandrew is right now? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Mark, you want to tackle that? Uh, absolutely. It seems like Mandrew has finally made it to the small <laughs> desert town of Port. Finally. <laughs> finally. <laughs> All right. Later. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, remember from the beginning of the game, uh, the Mer Mercenaries Guild leader was saying, hey, this town of Court is going to be coming under attack and we just don't have the resources to help defend it properly. Will you, you know, go over there and help it? So Mandrew made his way there and he is about to experience the uh, assault on Court. Basically it. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, right. So, you know, we think that this may come as a surprise to the player. You know, sometimes in RPGs, it's kind of like, go here, get this thing, bring it back, you know, whatever. This, we're trying to make more of kind of a, a storyline that's following you. So you're, you know, joining this guild, getting some kind of experience with the world, coming to help this town. But meanwhile, other things are brewing. And there's some hints about what's going on. It's possible that Mandra could have visited other towns and such before coming to court and getting a sense of kind of the tension between the towns, some of the um, race hatred that we've built into the game between the goblins and humans. Some and, of the humans. And some of the some humans, of, yes. yes. Yeah. All right. Don't paint the humans with a broad brush. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so all of that is kind of building and... If we weren't doing a speed run, then reading the stories and talking to the NPCs would kind of build up to this kind of bubbling um, tension that's existing in the game. And so when you come to court, this assault kind of naturally occurs as something that makes sense within what's going on in this world, right? But it, nevertheless, we hope it's still a surprise because... You know, uh, often in, in this game, you're free to do whatever you want, but here we kind of force something on you. You know, this is something that's happening in the world that just happens to happen to the player. It's not prompted by the player. I will say, though, that the number of let streamers who get curb stomped by the city guard when they demand to stay at the inn for free is something oh. that I will always cherish because yes. it's such yes. a great reaction because they Everything. all are always like, oh, yeah, I deserve that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. well, at first they're like, what the heck is this? Yeah. <laughs> right. And interestingly, that was put in long ago in Last Dream 1 because uh, a friend of Andrew and mine, uh, well, all of all of ours, uh, uh, kind of was like, why can't I insist to stay for free and attack <laughs> them and, right. and, and uh, uh, get to not have to spend money? I forgot and, about that. Yeah. Even better that that's based on a real person. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, libertarian. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I like that as well because I 
find it kind of frustrating sometimes in RPGs where you're kind of this massively powerful warrior and you're just crushing through people, right? There's really no one that you're not willing to take on. And then all of a sudden you run up against like a guy with a boat and he's like, nope. You can't go on this boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's like, well, what if I make you? It's like, nope, you can't. I'm I'm 13, I run this boat ferry and you <laughs> you just can't go. Yeah, so, so ironically, I said the same thing about our playthrough here. When we get to the boat ferry, I was like, wait, why can't we? <laughs> why can't I just hijack that boat? 